Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Bob Christensen here for the uh, CMTA webinars this month. And um, I think you're going to really enjoy the, this evening's program. We have uh, Kim Goodsell. And uh, the title of this one is called Through the Looking Glass and What We Can Do to Manage Our CMT Today. And um, so this is uh, going to be an interesting hour. Um, Kim has encouraged everyone to ask questions as we go. So please feel free to do so as we go through the webinar this evening. And I'll explain in a moment um, just how to do that. Um, Kim's uh, message is simple. Uh, how each of our CMT conditions will play out um, will not be determined by our genes alone. And uh, for all those wandering around through the wonderland of CMT, no need to be lost. And uh, she's going to give us some tips and tools on how she's uh, accomplished what she has. Um, she has the, uh, I think, unique um, issues of having both Charcot-Marie Tooth and uh, a heart disorder called ARVC, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. I hope I said that right, Kim. You did. That was very good. <laughs> All right, thanks. Awesome. So um, Kim has found herself in, in, a, in an interesting situation, and she has really put her mind to solving her own disability. And so I think we're, we're really going to have a good conversation here this evening. Um, with that, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody there is a questions panel in the right-hand side of the um, webinar console on your screen. So if you have questions as they go along, um, please feel free to ask them. Um, I will respond when I can, and I will help where I can with any technical issues. Um, and then I'll try and direct questions that are appropriate to Kim as soon as possible and get them in there. So we hope you keep listening. So um, with that said, Kim, welcome and good evening. I uh, hope you're doing well this evening. I'm doing great, and what a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Well, you're more than welcome. So listen, I'm going to start off real quick with uh, like a, a simple question. How did you uh, become publicly characterized as the patient of the future, you know, here and now? Well, it's um, a very simple question, but there's a long answer to it, and, and so let's get started. It's a little journey. I'm going to start by, off by talking about zebras in a medical context. So what a zebra means in a medical context, the slang for an exotic diagnosis when a more commonplace one is likely. And medical students are taught in school that if they, you know, it's everybody is taught this, when you hear hoofbeats, you think horses, not zebras. But as it turns out, the CMT community, we, we are all zebras and with zebra diagnoses. And as a consequence, many of us have probably experienced a delay in diagnosis due to the fact that our doctors were looking for horses instead of zebras. A disease is considered rare when it affects fewer than 1 in 2,000 people. As it turns out, it's not rare to have a rare disease. One out of 10 people, that's 10% of the American population, has a rare disease. But there are 7,000 rare diseases, and the prevalence in the population of any one of them is really low. CMT is considered to be one of the more common rare diseases. Its prevalence is 1 in 2,500. To address rare diseases, it takes a complex collaborative partnership with the government, academia, industry, and nonprofits, and these partnerships are in and of themselves rare. So it's not uncommon to investigate our diseases to a greater depth than our clinicians. My stripes are even more rare than other zebras. I have two rare diseases, CMT, which we're all familiar with, and ARVC, which Bob actually pronounced correctly. Um, which we have never seen, it's never been seen in, in one patient before, the, to both, you know, both diseases to be in one patient. Um, and I have a probable third, which is EDMD, um, Emory Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. And as I would discover, I had an extremely rare mutation in the LMNA gene, which you don't have to remember. But some of, it, of you may have seen the curious case of Benjamin Button starring Brad Pitt as a child. He was born old, and he, as he aged, he got younger. The movie was a Hollywood twist on the disease called progeria, where children are born looking like they're 80, and they die at an average age of about 13 from aging complications. 
Sam Burns was the, the face of Benjamin Button disease. He died a couple of years ago, sadly. Uh, Sam and I share a genetic diagnosis called laminopathy. Laminopathies mimic the normal but an accelerated degenerative process of aging. And Sam had a, a systemic laminopathy, a phenotype known as progeria. And, is, um, and as a consequence, it was a consequence of a single base substitution on the lamina gene. I also have a single base substitution, um, but my, the location of mine was in a, in a different place which gave, gave less severe um, but more rare phenotypes. Presently, I'm the only one in the world known to have this overlapping continuum of the rare conditions. Uh, like we said, the ARVC, CMT, EDMD, and, and they're not, um, physicians like to call them like phenotypes. In other words, it's not like absolutely you have CMT, you have ARVC, and you have EDMD because it's not known to, they're not known to co-segregate, so, so there's an unknown significance there. So they like to say like instead of absolute, which is, is great. It's pretty funny, actually. There's a whole conundrum occurring with diagnoses since the um, since genetic medicine has come into existence, and because all of our diagnoses were based on on symptoms rather than or our presentations, rather than on molecular um, realities of of gene mutations. So that's where the the problem is coming in today. So the proteins in the lamina. Uh, gene codes for um, an architect for proteins that provide the architectural scaffolding of the nuclear membrane. So it's easy to understand if you look at the right uh, image there. It's very chaotic. It doesn't have a nice fabric network, and that leads to a compromised structure of the nuclear membrane, which makes the cell susceptible to mechanical stress. And then it, and it accelerates programmed cell death. So I have, um, like all neurodegenerative diseases, there's a rapid die-off of our nerves occurring. If you calculate the odds of having an overlapping continuum of ARBC and CMT and EDMD, my odds were 4 in 10 million. I had better chance of being hit by an asteroid. Have you ever wondered why we ride horses? and not zebras. Humans domesticate wild animals by making them dependent on us for food. By making them dependent on us for food, we're able to make them pretty much compliant to whatever we want them to do, like walk down a chute to their death or whatever. And domesticated animals are species that can be taken from the wild and will thrive in cap cap um, captivity. But when zebras are taken from the wild, they will not thrive, they won't breed, they're, they're, you know, they're, they'll get very depressed, and so they, they can't, they won't eat, they, and, and they can't be domesticated. Well, both my husband and I are zebras. He has a rare lung disease called aspergillus, and um, air pollution exasperates his condition and can precipitate a life-threatening asthma attack. So as preventative lifestyle strategy, we naturally have gravitated towards to the wilderness, and we've spent the majority of our lives in remote regions of the world. We, um, we don't thrive in captivity, we can't be domesticated, and we're not going to ever complacently walk down a chute to our death. So in 1996, I was told that I was likely to drop dead of sudden cardiac death. And in 1997, I had sudden cardiac death event. And I was resuscitated and implanted with an um, implantable internal cardio defibrillator. It's a little computer that reads every heartbeat. And when it detects a life-threatening arrhythmia, it delivers a shock. When it does, it's like a bomb exploding in my chest. It, it literally can knock me off my feet. And it results in post-traumatic stress disorder, which can last for a matter of months until I forget it. And my body forgets that it got shocked. Nothing likes to get shocked. And I felt like a dog with a shock collar around my neck after I was implanted. One fast sprint or a wrong thought even. If I, if I got nervous, too nervous about something, uh, especially if I was, if I was um, riding my bike and my heart rate was up, and I would get shocked. And I felt, if I felt an arrhythmia coming on 
and I panicked, which would be the natural reaction if you knew the next thing that was going to happen was that you would get shot. That would speed up my rhythm even faster, and for sure I would get shot. So I learned quickly how to control my panic, and I was successful at preempting shocks by dropping into a very rapid med meditation. I had, you know, like 28 seconds to convert myself before the ICD would kick in and shock me. I also had to slow down because at a certain threshold, um, a rapid heartbeat would become life-threatening arrhythmia for me. But I continued to engage in what some might consider to be endurance athlete, um, activities, but, but just slow. I began, I mean, in 19, I mean, I'm sorry, in 2006, I began to experience an awkward clumsy, clumsiness and difficult balancing. Um, I started tripping and falling when I was running, and I began to break bones. I broke three bones in my leg in a kiting accident, and then a year later, I was, I let loose a rock while we were climbing, and I was pinned upside down by a boulder, crushing my leg and breaking it again. Um, and it had it not been for the supreme efforts of my husband to lift the rock off of me, which was almost not possible, um, I would have been in the same predicament as Aaron Wal Ralston, the uh, climber who had to cut off his arm in order to free himself. That was several years ago. I don't know if you remember it, but it was pretty dramatic. Soon after that, I broke my jaw and tore off my cheek in a freak mountain bike accident. And uh, in 2010, I experienced a systems crash. I wasn't going any further. My motor function had deteriorated. I was crippled by arthritic pain. I was plagued by a host of autoimmune conditions. And I began to experience hearing loss. I had difficulty speaking at times due to uh, larynx paralysis. And, um, I actually am experiencing a tiny bit of that right now. It comes and goes, and so my voice is not too robust, and I apologize for that. I was evaluated um, at the Mayo Clinic, and it, for four days, I, they ran me through a host of tests. It was, I ran from clinic to clinic, literally. Well, I wheeled from clinic to clinic, quite literally, for four days. And at the end of it, I was diagnosed with CMT. Uh, the nerve condition, a systemic bone degenerative condition, and a possible EDMD, which is a degenerative muscle condition, often affecting the heart, um, heart failure, and hip dysplasia. I was discharged with no actionable information other than to come back for a new hip or toe to, uh, when I could, couldn't stand the pain any longer, and I was given a prognosis of progressive heart failure and disability and a need for a uh, heart transplant, possibly in the future. I have fallen down a rabbit hole into a hall of locked doors. And impaled on the horns of that kind of dilemma, I did what any smart rabbit would do. I began reading. I seized my moment in this digital age of information and making use of online mutation data banks and the PubMed research data. I found the key that opened a door and free fell into a nonsensical genetic world of indeterminacy. I dove as deeply as I could possibly bear into the molecular intricacies and into an unfamiliar landscape of paradoxical labyrinths and incomprehensible comp complexity. Targeting a suspected gene culprit, I self-financed its sequencing and I cracked the genetic code. I wrote a white paper and had the good fortune of having my case evaluated by the world's leading expert on inheritable cardiomyopathies. I presented him with my paper, and he was impressed because I had anticipated a connection between the lamina gene and my cardiomyopathy that had not yet been recognized by science. And uh, at the time, uh, the research had just come out that had um, actually confirmed that, and I had, I had beat them to it. So he was really excited to publish the fact that that had happened. Uh, the abstract was um, accepted for featured presentation at the Heart Rhythm Society's annual scientific sessions. And when I went to register for the event so that I could present my poster, I couldn't because I lacked credentials. My honorary doctorate degree from the prestigious Google University of Medicine didn't qualify me. 
And uh, Dr. Topol, who was delivering the opening plenary at the event, um, exercised his clout and put pressure on the academy and one day out of the blue I received two complimentary registrations from my husband and myself uh, for the, um, from, the, from the program director and I was then to become the first lay patient ever to present their own research at this prestigious professional forum. Topol's keynote plenary was on uh, digital genomic future in medicine and, and what that meant to the profession. And when he began to speak about how the online democratization of information was changing the face of medicine, to my utter shock, my picture appeared on three huge screens and he introduced me to the audience as the patient of the future here now, the poster child of this new face in medicine. He told them that I was presenting my poster directly following the plenary, and I, it was shocking both to the audience and myself. It was a mind twister for the doctors to accept the fact that a patient had done the researchers, and it was really funny because when I was standing, you stand in front of your poster and people wander through, it's a, you know, an evening event, and there's all d'oeuvres and whatnot, and, um, I would have these researchers dropping by to see my poster and they kept asking me questions like, well, did you run this, that, or the other genetic test on the patient? And I had to keep clarifying, I am the patient, I am the patient, but they just, they literally, they, they just couldn't wrap their mind around it. So backing up a bit, I have been introduced to uh, Dr. Topol, who is the foremost expert in medical visionary and exploding world of digital and geno genomic medicine through this NPR interview called iDoctor, Could the Smartphone Be the Future of Medicine? He demonstrated these remarkable remote medical sensors. And at the end of the interview, Dr. Topol is asked what he sees the patient of the future looking like. And he answered, the patient of the future is going to be the biggest difference. There's, they'll be able to seize the moment in this digital age of information and seize the data. The medicine will be plugged into them. They're going to drive it. I contacted Topol's office for an appointment because I wanted a prescription for this remote EKG monitor he had demonstrated. The reason why is because I thought it, it would really help me manage the shocks from my, from my internal cardio defibrillator because I could monitor what my rhythm was looking like when I, while I was exercising in real time. And this could be a tremendous benefit for me. At the, um, at the end of the letter, I audaciously added that I thought I might just be that patient of the future that he was referring to in his interview, and I sent him a copy of my white paper. It was winter, and we were living in a remote cottage on the shores of northern Lake Michigan uh, when I had seen the interview, and I would have to wait until the fall before I was granted an appointment six months into the future. He's a really busy, very, very famous guy. In fact, probably some of our listeners tonight um, have, have seen the eye doctor, the future of medicine, or, or heard of Dr. Topol. When Dr. Topol entered the room, he ex ex claimed that I was amazing and I was just shocked because I, you know, he was like a rock star to me and and then he asked me if I would jump start his future genomic conference um, on stage interview with him to an audience of genomic researchers and physicians that was going to happen the following March and I, I was just speechless. At the conference Topol introduced me to patient as the patient from the future here today. And uh, I told the story of my scientific abstract being accepted at the HRS sessions, but that I wasn't able to register for the event to present it. And uh, Dr. Topol replied that medical, that was medical paternalism at its finest. The story was featured on the front page of the newspaper, and from then on I was known as the patient of the future. I suddenly found myself in the center stage uh, in the most profound disruption in the history of healthcare, speaking to professionals and offering the voice of the patient at these professional forums. My story was written up by Ed Young, a National Geographic science writer, um, under a Creative Commons license and was republished several, in several other publications. And that is how I came to join all of you today, because uh, someone in the CMT athletes group had come across the article. So I want to thank you for inviting me um, to join your group and, and of zebras. And, and now let's walk together into the future of health and explore some 
strategies that we can go right now to help us. So Kim, what um, what does uh, what does it look like? I mean, it's, your journey is fascinating here. Um, so what does the future of medicine look like for um, people and people with CMT in particular? Well, it's really I am so optimistic. Because it's, as Topol said, the patient of the future is the biggest change. Patients have access to data and tools that they've never had before, ever. There's a rising future of digital genomic medicine that is ushering an era, ushering in an era of enlightenment that's about enabling human potential so that all people are given the opportunity to take control and guide the outcomes of their health. And the science is exponentially um, accelerating. So I'll tell you what some of the tools are. Um, information is power, of course, and the information about the self is self-empowering. Surfing the web, we can acquire valuable information um, about our conditions and, and participate with our doctors in the co-production uh, co of medical intelligence for the first time in medical history. And consumer direct genomic testing is now available. This is, this is really incredible stuff. For $200, we can get a genetic panel done that can give us a, a much deeper understanding into the roles that our genes are playing in our individual lives. This self-knowledge affords us the opportunity to make informed, preventative lifestyle modifications. And 23andMe, the company, is combining the potential of genetics and the internet to have significant positive impact on accelerating research at a pace and with a patient um, population, a patient database that traditional science has never known. It's always been a, a difficulty for researchers to get enough patients together to really run uh, significant, you know, have significant numbers to really see what's going on and, and, and um, that's been the biggest problem and, and it's very costly. They're doing it, they're, they have, they've sequenced a million um, genes, a million different people, over a million now, and this is, um, this data goes in without, you know, you, have, you get a choice as to whether you want to participate in your own genomic data, uh, which is fascinating. People have so much fun with it. I mean, it will tell you if you're predisposed to this, that, or the other thing, or, you know, if you're lactate intolerant, or, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it, um, it's the numbers now we are being entered into the to research so that they can really see you know like you, you're asked if you want to participate let's say in asthma research and and if you're an asthmatic and and it, it's just it's so powerful so there's also remote sensing technology that's giving us real-time data upon which we can immediately act as in my case with these um, with this remote EKG that I use daily. It's a case that fits on the back of my phone and all I have to do is put my fingers on the back of it and it will read out my EKG. I can just push the send button and send it off for an analysis. It will come back and it will tell me if I'm in danger and what's going on. I actually saved by my mom's life by using it on her. She had become real complacent um, and was actually in the throes of, of heart failure and uh, her heart rate had dropped down to 30 beats per minute and, and I couldn't get her to go to the ER. Uh, she's just not a doctor person and she was very apathetic because she wasn't getting any brain to, blood to her brain. and. Her blood pressure was skyrocketing, and I just I couldn't convince her. So I um, I took her EKG, sent it off for an analysis. It came back within minutes, and it said code red. You know, immediately um, immediate emergency. You know, immediately see see a physician. So I showed it to her, and and in her compromised state, it got through to her. I mean, she realized that if we didn't get down to the ER, she was not going to make it. And I, um, I, meanwhile, while she got dressed, I sent off the data to the physician that was on call for the electrophysiology, and uh, she needed a pacemaker, and I, I was pretty sure that was the problem, but he looked at it and he said, how did you 
you have an EKG? And I said, yeah, I'll send it to you. And, and he looks at it and he says, yeah, you got to get her down here immediately. And when we got to the hospital, she was already pre-admitted and scheduled for surgery the next morning, um, you know, after in-house evaluation was confirmed. And uh, we, we event, you know, essentially we saved thousands of dollars with her not having to go through the ER for Medicare. And it, so that's a really tangible example of how the cost of medicine will be um, drastically reduced when, when we have these kind of technologies in the population at large. So patient access to data is changing the faces of medicine, as we said before, and the patient is becoming a participant in the co-production of medical intelligence, as we said before. Um, hence the title of Dr. Topol's new book called The Patient Will See You Now, of which I star in along with Angelina Jolie, and all of us are probably very familiar with her story, and that was that she had been sequenced through 23andMe and discovered that she had the BRCA gene. Uh, and she ra you know, took a, a decision upon herself to have a, a radical mastectomy. And the FDA, as a consequence, shut the um, ability for, F for 23andMe down. They, they were no longer allowed to give patients, or consumers in this case, uh, direct information about their their results. I mean, they this is their data. This is their genome. You know, they they should own it and they should own the data. But there was a, a big problem with that because they thought that because of Angelina Jolie, um, she was an example of people that would would get too excited and do these these very radical procedures as a consequence. Well, as it turns out. Um, everybody who knows her history, her mother and her grandmother had died of this, and she didn't want to leave her children um, to be, um, you know, um, orphans. So she she took it upon herself as a preventative measure, and it was radical. But anyway, uh, as the story ends up, uh, just about six months ago, the FDA has ruled that uh, 23andMe is now again able to to give health information to directly to consumers without a physician intervening. So that's a real interesting thing that's going on here. So are there any questions? I'm just rambling on. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, interesting, it seems, a lot of interesting um, technology available to us, you know. To this, the, the, you're talking about the gene sequencing. We have a lot of that in the CMT community. Um, uh, many of us, there's over 80 different identified uh, genes causing CMT that we're able to um, identify through testing. And I'm curious, how, how does your CMT affect you? I know you have some other problems that go along with it, but the, the CMT, how are, you seem to be more of an extreme athlete, and you found us through the, uh, the CMT Athletes Group, which is a fantastic group of people with CMT are really getting out there and, and, and living life. So I'm curious how your CMT affects you and if you, uh, um, you know, could share that with us, that would be great. Well, it affects me. I, I do have to do workarounds. I, I'm very disciplined at stretching and um, really, because I have a lot of muscle contractures, um, a lot of cramping. Um, I live a very, very strict um, life on my diet as far as what I eat. And if I vary from it, I'll, you know, the next day, if I go out to eat the next, and I'll explain why, that is, if I go out to eat the next day, I will experience drop foot. As of right now, I'm, I was in and out of a wheelchair. Um, I was using a walker all the time, and sometimes a wheelchair because the pain was so bad. And that had a lot also to do with arthritic pain. Um, I have dysplasia, hip dysplasia, and I've had one hip replaced. But since I started my preventative measures with my diet, the other hip, which was really bad, I couldn't decide which hip actually to have replaced because they both were so bad, and along with all my other joints for that matter. And um, I kind of delayed it for a while because I couldn't decide which one. 
So now, and that's been five years now, um, my other hip is fine. All my other joints are fine. So we'll, we'll get into, uh, I, I have no pain, absolutely no pain at all. So it's not as though I cured my disease. I am managing it, and I'm managing it through diet and exercise. And we'll so, go um, into detail on that. Yeah, when you, when you talk about your diet and your CMT, how did you... How did you come to figure out, you know, what worked for you? I mean, I guess, you know, everybody will, you know, naturally be slightly different. But how did you how did you go about that process of figuring out what works for you as far as diet? Well, what's going to, there are some, I did a lot of science. I mean, I, I didn't just, you know, this wasn't whimsical, you know, oh, I'm going to try this out or the other thing. This was very rigorous science that I, after I sequenced my gene, um, we'll, I kind of have a slide that will go through that. I, I harnessed the power of the genetic information to study the protein that was mutated. And, and um, my entry was ALS. I was... Uh, Originally, I was diagnosed with ALS, and one of the things about ALS are very, very many people who have ALS have a mutation in a gene that doesn't allow them to have uh, to to reuptake glutamate, and we'll get into that. It's a neurotransmitter, um, and it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, and if you have too much of it, it literally excites the neurons to death. And they, they die, it's, what, it's a process, glutamate drives apoptosis, which is natural cell death, and, and, and everybody, I mean, we're, we're replacing our cells all the time. If we didn't have that process where a cell would get old or get damaged in some way and, and we weren't able to slough it off, that actually um, is what turns cells into tumors. So it's when the, the, they're not sloughed off when they need to be sloughed off. I mean, something's wrong with them. So it's, it's, um, it's out of balance in all neurodegenerative dis diseases. And I'll show you the research on that. It's really interesting. And I'll also talk about uh, where it is in our diet because we are being exposed to it. The human race has never been exposed to it. We weren't made to eat it, and we are eating it in all our processed food today because it's an ex it, it, it excites the neurons on your tongue, and it makes things taste good, and it's addictive. The food processors are putting it into the food because it makes their food taste good. And uh, they don't have to label it as such. Um, it's monosodium glutamate. It's, a lot of people are aware of what monosodium glutamate is. Uh, they don't have to label it as such if it's not 97% monosodium glutamate. So it's, it's labeled under things like natural spices, natural seasoning, natural um, flavorings, um, just a host. There's like 70 ingredients listed that really are uh, glutamates disguised because a lot of people, I mean, the food industry knows that most people aren't too, too excited about monosodium glutamate. Um, it's a real interesting history behind it, but I'll show you the, this is, is why I got into it was because with ALS, the only drugs that have been somewhat successful have been glutamate block, receptor blocker drugs so that, that they actually block the action of glutamate, and they come along with a lot of different side effects and whatnot. And I thought, well, you know, there's so much in our food today, in the free, you know, that, that is free glutamate. It's fine if it's bound. I mean, when you eat meat, when you eat veg, everything has glutamate in it, but it's bound in, in a cellular in a matrix. But we're getting it in a crystallized form, like, you know, the difference between uh, um, a sugar cane and crystallized sugar. Real big difference there as far as what it does to you and how quickly, you know, it spikes your, your, um, your, um, uh, now I want to say adrenaline, insulin. <laughs> so anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit because that is probably the main thing along with some very common sense stuff that's very general. And then on top of that, I did some, you know, um, allergy testing just to make sure that anything that would be compromising my immune system, I wasn't putting into me. Um, so 
we'll, we'll kind of get into that. I'll run through that with my into the slideshow here. And um, then, uh, you know, one of the questions I wanted to answer at this part um, was what the advances in genetics, what they are and what they mean for the rare disease community because this is where the, the future is so bright for us. So let's just kind of run through that. The next uh, generation gene sequencing has brought about whole genomic sequencing that is cost effective and clinically practical. And, and so when the first human genome was sequenced, it cost, I think, $1.5 billion. Today it costs $1,000. For the rare disease community, this means that there will no longer be diagnostic delays and shots in the dark. Uh, it's very easy now to get a whole genomic sequencing done. Uh, there's new hope for an acceleration, acceleration of discovery for real treatments and cures for genetic diseases. Uh, strategies that target the root cause, the molecular cause, the actual gene that is caught the genetic mutation that is, is causing the whole problem. And it, it will treat, you know, of course, these, these new cures are going to talk, they're very, you know, like you said, there was 80 um, variations of genes that account for CMT. So we have to realize that we will not have an effective one drug fits all you have to have 80 at this point because you have to, to really cure something. You have to affect treatment on the, the root, which is that mutation. And it's different in, in many, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's 80 of them known today, and, and that's growing. You know, every day there's more that are be, being discovered, like I did. I mean, I discovered a, a gene that was associated with a phenotype. The, that had never been associated with it before me. And so we're all very unique. And genetic, the science of genetics allows us to really target, precision target, the root causes of each our individual uh, variations of CMT. And, and so there really is new hope for discovery of real treatments and cures and strategies that can get down to the roots. And, you know, these are strategies that our children really can't wait for. I mean, we have, what is it, 35% of children who are diagnosed with a rare disease die within the first five years. So parents are really active, and, and of course, a lot of them are um, founders of foundations and, non, um, and uh, nonprofits to, to help bring these complex collaborative communities together so that they can really get some research focused on their child's rare disease condition. So another, um, another really cool thing that's occurring is a new science, and it's um, the study of how genes affect a person's response to drugs. And it's called, uh, I always mess this up, pharmacogenomics. Actually, did pretty well on that this time. <laughs> This, this new field combines pharmacology and genomics to develop effective, safe medications and doses that will be tailored to a person's unique genetic makeup. So the one-size-fits-all drug therapy in use today, it's costing $350 billion a year, one-third of which is a total waste. We're prescribing drugs that not only don't work, in one third of the patients that they're prescribed to, on average, but they have back they backfire with with some very deleterious side effects. So the the new science of epigenetics is another really um, exciting field. So this is a new understanding of how the, a gene does not determine the outcome of our lives in any way. Epi means on top of or outside. So it means outside the gene. What it means is epigenetic influence is what happens environmentally to affect gene expression. So I'm going to show you what the scope of the epigenetic landscape includes. 
We're talking about a metabolic environment. That's the food that we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe. And I've got two you know, pictures on top of each other. Very, very different outcomes when you're eating the, the salad on top versus the, the hamburger, fries, and chicken and Coke below. If you're drinking fresh, you know, alkaline spring water versus drinking out of a polluted, you know, body of water like this poor little child has to do, uh, the air we breathe, you know, if we're living in Beijing versus, you know, an open, open country that is, doesn't have the pollution, air pollution, these all affect the outcome of the expression, the actual expression of our genes is modified through our metabolic environment. What we eat really, really does matter. And so then there's the macro environment. This is how we experience the world. I mean, if we're working versus kiteboarding, if we're stuck in a traffic every day instead of you know, going down these, these remote roads and having a beautiful experience, if we're, you know, impoverished and we're and we're spending our lives, you know, in despair and a and and you know, scrambling for food versus having a having a you know well nourished and uh, very um, nourishing environment that we're living in, this is ex this is actually changing how our genes are expressing themselves at a genetic level. This is all new stuff. I mean, they didn't, they didn't realize this before. That they now know it to be true. So there's a quantum environment. That's the way in which the, the mental landscape, how we think. I mean, are we, are we doing fabulous things, climbing mountains, or are we shooting up drugs? Are we, are we just terribly depressed, or are we very happy elderly people? Um, th these things really make a, a, a significant, have a significant influence on how the genes are expressing themselves. And the way each of our CMT conditions plays out and the way we age will be a function of our genes interacting with this epigenetic landscape. So what we do, how we, you know, what, what we're doing really, really does matter. So when I petitioned to have my um, LMNA gene sequence, the geneticists tried to discourage me, and they said, she said, well, it's very expensive. The odds are nearly impossible that you have targeted the causal gene. You know, you, you, you're just another of those Google Go, you know, researchers on the Internet. You know nothing about genetics, and, and, and I believed her at that point. Um, and even if I did crack it, she said, it would be a minimal um, benefit. The results were truly remarkable. Um, I harnessed the power of the genomic information and invoking the wisdom of the ancients, I devised a wildly successful treatment strategy that turned back the hands of time. I not only slowed down the neurodegenerative process, I reversed much of it, and I was able to walk, walk once more without aid. In addition, my cardiac instability virtually disappeared, and I haven't had any breakthrough events um, of sudden cardiac death, which I've had literally hundreds. I have not had any in now four years since I started my diet, actually. So this is the ancient wisdom here. Um, first, do no harm. So while pharmacogenomics holds the promise of safe prescription dosing, today properly prescribed drugs is the fourth leading cause of death due to their deleterious unintended side effects. Medical treatment is third. Uh, it's uh, right behind heart disease and cancer, and this is this is um, data from the um, Journal of American Medical Association, JAMBA. Um, that was re not something we really hear a whole lot about because it's a, it's a terrible embarrassment, but hospitals and medical treatment is actually very, very dangerous. So we want, our best hope is, is that we don't go there in the first place. We prevent. So the other, uh, the, the next um, 
drop of wisdom here is let food be your medicine. We have to, it's so simple, it's, it's sublimely simple. Every cellular activity, activity is mediated by the food we eat. And the human species evolved to eat food that grew out of the ground and grazed on grass. Our bodies have miraculous strategies for healing. I mean, we are able to heal things we never thought were uh, tissues that could be healed. I mean, people can regenerate fingers. Uh, the brain can, can heal itself. Uh, bone degeneration, arthritic conditions where you actually have already started developing cysts, they can go away. The, the body is a miraculous thing. We can't even come close to what it is capable of doing, but it has to be given the right nutrients so that it can use them to build, to repair the tissues, obviously. So I only eat organic. Uh, the mainstay of my diet is raw vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds, just like you know, wild people would have eaten millions of years ago. Uh, and a lot of high quality fats, and I'll and I'll get into that because a lot of time, and that's very surprising given the um, the paradigm that we were given in the 80s. So and and that's being very much turned over today. Uh, it hasn't reached the masses in in great quantity yet, though. That that information. So um, my diet is very similar to the ketogenic diet. And uh, if any of you are familiar with that, if you're not, you should look up the Charlie Foundation. Um, and even the movie, First Do No Harm, it's a movie starring Meryl Streep in which um, she is a mother of a child that has severe epilepsy. And uh, it's her journey and how she found this research that had existed in these, this therapy that had been, been in practice at John Hopkins since the 1920s. It's, it's fascinating um, that she was able to, that, and this is a real life story actually, the producer of it, his son was Charlie, and it was based on his son's experience. But they were, were able to Re reverse and stop his epileptic fits forever. They never returned again. And this was a child that was having several a day's life-threatening events. So I, I highly recommend that because they're using the key, they're finding that the ketogenic diet, which is a very high fat diet, and the science behind it is very solid. Um, I can get into it, but you probably don't want to hear it. Uh, so I won't, but the the Anybody interested in that, they're using it for ALS, all these neurodegenerative diseases, and they're having um, fabulous uh, results. And I was doing it because I had done it based on, I was doing it, I know about the ketogenic diet, the name of that. I just did it because that's where my research led me to, to, to eating a very high fat diet, really quality high fat though. So, so Kim, let me, let me, uh, uh, let me, oh, go ahead, you continue on here. No, go ahead. Um, I just want to, do you take any vitamins or supplements to go along with this diet, or is it pretty, do you get um, everything you need out of this diet? So if, if you eat, if you cut out all your carbohydrates, I mean virtually all your starchy carbohydrates, you can say that a vegetable and fruit is a carbohydrate, and it really is, but I'm talking starchy carbohydrates here. I think we all know what that is, and, and sugary foods and whatnot. If you cut that out of your diet, you will um, eat a massive, you'll end up eating more of a massive amount of, you know, leafy greens. I mean, you can eat an enormous amount. These things are loaded with nutrients and antioxidants. They're much more assimilable than a vitamin pill is going to be because we evolved to assimilate it in that fashion. Um, and, and so I have, I started off taking supplements. The problem is most of them, besides the fact that they're not as, as readily assimilable, um, the, the, the problem is, is that most of them are encapsulated either with gelatin or, or if they're encapsulated at all, they're either done with gelatin or a uh, vegetable, hydrolyzed vegetable um, covering. These coverings are very high in glutamate, and just because of the amount of processing that they have to go through to synthesize these, these membrane-type things that go around these capsules. So I'll get into the glutamate thing, because that's 
like I said, the most effective thing to reverse neurodegenerative process and slow it down. So I just want to do a quick time check here. We're at 8.50, so I have about 10 minutes left. Okay. Um, and I have a question that came in um, that relates to the diet, and that is, do you still eat animal proteins? I do. Um, you don't have to. I find that I, I, you know, I really feel like I need it. Now, that being said, only high quality, only grass fed, only organic. And, you know, the picture that I have up on the screen right now, the Green Revolution, that began after World War II. It grew out of a repurposing for nerve gases developed in chemical warfare. So it, it doesn't take a whole lot of common sense to realize people who are compromised, everybody, but especially the community of people who are compromised neurologically, we don't want to be exposing ourselves to neurotoxins. That's obvious. So, you know, that it means that I never, ever, I mean, I don't eat out, I don't, I eat 100% organic, or I don't eat it, because I can't afford to be exposed to neurotoxins. And the, uh, the other thing um, we talked about was, um, I had started to touch upon, was fats. Uh, this is the matrix of our, our nerve um, sheaths that cover and, and insulate our nerves. It's, it's the problem with a lot of um, CMT is either axonal or it's part of the, um, the myelinated sheaths that is a problem. And so we have, um, we have to keep fat, we have to keep the fat membranes around our cells and around all of our um, nerves and cells and, and in fact our brain. We have to keep that healthy. So our cellular membranes, they're composed of proteins in, in a matrix of fat. Our nerves are insulated by fat and our brains are composed of fat. A typical breakfast or lunch of mine has um, a lot of, you know, like fresh vegetable, uh, fresh fruit and a lot of chia seeds, cacao nibs, which are natural chocolate, which are also high in protein and fats, um, vegetable salads for lunch. Um, and we need to shift our diet from high carbohydrates, as I said, to high quality fats. Uh, today, so this is the big thing that everybody needs to kind of really think about. If nothing else, you take away this from, from my talk, and that's free glutamate. Uh, it's a neuroexcitotoxin. It's in virtually every processed food, whether it's organic or not. And it's labeled, like I said, under many different um, labels. You can find what it's labeled under, under truth and labeling. Just Google that. So the food today has become our poison. Glutamate, the neurotransmitter, um, it's listed, like I said, on just in every ingredient label you can find. And here is one piece of research I pulled out just to really drive this home. It's a, a pictorial review of glutamate, glutamate excitotoxicity. So neurologists, um, it says, may encounter on a daily basis a, a challenging diversity of neurological disorders, and it had listed a whole bunch, took those out to make it short. This spectrum of disease is not usually thought as sharing the same mechanism of neural injury and death. Uh, these are, and a growing list of other neurological disorders are now understood to share a final common destructive metabolic pathway called excitotoxicity. The specific type of excitotoxicity triggered by the amino acid glutamate is, key, is the key mechanism implicated in the mediation of neuronal death in many disorders. And that is really the key. This is the, the key ingredient we need to, to get out of our diet. So um, when you eat free glutamate, it's like throwing fuel on the fire. We already have a fire going on. We have an accelerated cell death occurring within us. So we need to, we really need to get that out of our diet. The next thing is exercise. Walking is man's best, best medicine. And, you know, it, it really is the foundation of all life is movement. You stop moving, you're dead. So, Movement is pivotal to survival for all species, but for the human, I mean, for humans, 
I'm sorry. I'm not on another thing. I said here, oh, I to offset our difficulties. Oh, okay. So if you can't move and you're finding it difficult, whatever your level of movement is, find a way to keep moving. Whatever that means, do it. You have to do it. And, uh, you know, for human beings, the art of moving is, oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, oh, I had that slide up from another thing, and it, <laughs> it wants to be clicked to come on. Sorry about that. So for, oh, for human good. beings, is, is much more than survival. It's an art. And, and we need to be inspired to move. And, and it inspires us when we do move. So it, 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 the art movement is so fundamental to the human experience that the way in which we move expresses who we are as individuals and it engenders health and enriches our lives in, in so many ways. And it really is super essential. So I became uh, dependent on a walker. My husband and I experienced in a, the very uninspiring, dismal state of walker design. And, and it was just horrendous. I mean, it hadn't changed in 500 years, the interface. So we started making our own carbon fiber walkers that were more bike-like for me. And um, that just, you know, I'm just saying, you've got to find a way to offset your difficulties. Whatever that is, do it. You've got to do it. The other thing is making a habit to help. And uh, we started a California Benefit Corporation for the reason um, to, our reason for being is to design and equitably distribute state-of-the-art pedestrian assistant technology to enable and inspire people from all walks of life to walk to, to a future of health. So to get moving, whatever it means, do it. The other thing is, if possible, if you're walking, if you're near um, a beach especially, if you can have access to any soft surface, um, I find that walking barefoot in soft sand is really helpful to the the um, claw toe, the high arches, they're all a consequence of uneven muscle strength. And when you eat, walk in soft sand barefooted, it, it really kind of makes all of those muscles um, get wor a workout. And so that, that seems to be a really effective strategy. And our feet are very important, as you know. So the other thing is, while calling on the gods, a man should himself lend a hand. And this is my last slide, thank goodness, I'm sure. We have got to be active participants in our treatments. It, it's not going to happen by us taking a pill or, or you know, just waiting for something to happen. You have to get up and you've got to move. You've got to discipline yourself to eat well. You've got to use the information that you can extract and inspire yourself. Get out there and, and do it because I'm telling you, it's real. Healing is real. It really is. I, I was on death's door um, in 2010, and I'm not today at all. So um, thank you so much, and all of those wandering through Wonderland, the Wonderland of CMT, you don't have to be lost. I mean, there is information out there, there's help out there, but you have to be activists. So thank you so much. That was really fun. And um, any questions? We have a, a minute. Yeah, we have a couple minutes left here. Um, we do have a question here about um, uh, nightshades. What well, you know, types of vegetables, including you know, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers. Really? Um, do you do you I eat those? Never. Are they part of your diet? Absolutely never. And I had forgotten that. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, so nightshades have a poison. All nightshades have a degree of it, uh, and it's called solanine. Solanine is a neuro, um, it's, it's a neuro inhibitor. You do not want to be eating any nightshades whatsoever. That is one thing. You know, we didn't actually include it in our diet um, hundreds of years ago. It's a relatively new addition. So, so next question. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, uh, is there a place, I, I know you mentioned the Charlie Foundation for the, uh, for the diet. Um, are there any books or articles that you can recommend also for diet? Yes. Um, so the Charlie Foundation is your best source for the ketogenic diet. There is another called Unblind Your Mind. 
This is a fabulous site, and I really, really recommend it for everybody out there in the CMT community. Um, it's, uh, it's all about glutamate, and it, it is so well done, and it's so simplified and understandable, because it's very hard to enact this diet, diet that is free of glutamate, because it's so pervasive in our food supply. So I, I really recommend doing that, going to that site. It's called Unblind My Mind. And if uh, you can, um, from the title, it is, as I said, it's in everything, and it's really not obvious. So um, it's all about learning how to spot and to stay away from it. So that's a really good resource site. Thank you very much. Well, uh, we are at a little bit past 9, so I think uh, we'll probably um, stop here. I want to say thank you very much. Uh, I know you feel like you talked a lot, but it was very interesting, and I think everybody uh, online here uh, had a good uh, a good evening. Well, I so, hope so. Um, Any questions, you know, go ahead and keep firing them through the CMTA athletes group and, and I'll try to answer them like, if there's any out there. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kim, and thanks everybody for joining us. I uh, hope you'll join us again uh, next month. And uh, until then, uh, have a good evening. Thank you.